to Green Beauty Conversations, the podcast that challenges you to think about how you buy, use, make and sell your natural beauty formulations. We tackle topics that will make you think and encourage debate about green beauty with your friends, followers or customers. I'm your host, Lorraine Dahlmeyer. I'm a chartered environmentalist, biologist and the CEO of award-winning online organic cosmetic formulation school, Formula Botanica. We have thousands of students in over 160 countries worldwide who study with us to become organic beauty formulators and entrepreneurs. Visit our website at formulabotanica.com to try our free formulation training. So this is the Green Beauty Conversations podcast, but today we're changing the color slightly because we're talking about blue beauty. So I guess I should say, welcome to Blue Beauty Conversations. But what is blue beauty and how does it differ from green beauty? And why should all beauty brands be thinking about their environmental footprint and giving back to the environment? So to find out, today I am interviewing Jeannie Jarno, who is on a mission to deliver beauty you can trust, one hero product at a time, and who wants to make clean beauty the rule rather than the exception. The complexity of navigating cosmetic ingredients only fueled her passion to make it simple to discover safe, effective and luxurious skincare. Today, as the founder of Beauty Heroes, Jeannie brings a lifetime of beauty, wellness and ritual to her company and her customers, delivering healthy beauty through the thrill of discovery. So welcome to the podcast, Jeannie. Thank you, Lorraine. I'm excited to be here. So let's dive straight in. What is Blue Beauty? Blue Beauty was a a term that I coined after hearing an industry trendsetter talk about trends that were coming for the future and in a very meaningful way, not just like, oh, this is a beauty trend. It was more like global trends, societal trends. And it was a few years ago. And what he was explaining was that consumers and the world was really going to be pushing the envelope for beyond going green and looking for companies that are making a positive net impact on the environment that he called that going blue. And that had nothing to do with the beauty industry. Uh, that was just a sort of larger trend for, you know, industry, for all industries. I wrote that down and I, I was thinking about it that night after that conversation. And I thought about so many of the brands I was working with. I was working with Honua Skincare, a Hawaiian-based brand, and uh, several other brands. And we were working on environmental initiatives And what this kind of light bulb went off in my head. And I thought, well, that's what really the green beauty industry, the people who really, you know, founded green beauty, indie green beauty brands, that was their intention was to make a net positive impact on the environment. And sort of this aha moment happened where I was like, well, green beauty really is blue beauty. I decided that I wanted to tell that story. And I came back to my team and said, I want to launch something called Project Blue Beauty. And I want to tell the stories of how brands are making a net positive impact because while this is a trend that somebody is projecting for industry in general, true green beauty brands have been doing this all along. And I felt like they this needed to be told and, and Beauty Heroes was a good platform to be able to do that with. Okay, so you've already sort of touched on my next question then, but let's just run through this again. So how is blue beauty different to green beauty? Are they the same thing or not? You know, we've talked about this a lot on our platform. There's not like a hard line between green and blue. It's uh, There's gradations of it. And it's not blue beauty, just to contrast it to like what you might refer to as green, like green is sustainability and trying to lessen our impact on the environment, have a better impact on the environment. Blue beauty is really striving to have a net positive effect on the environment and understand that, you know, industry in general, everything we do has, you know, some impact on the environment. How can we use businesses and our, our, our beauty brands to actually contribute and give back. And those efforts are, 
what we sort of coin and talk about as blue beauty initiatives. And the motivation for us is to really inspire conversations and help keep pushing us in this direction. There's not really a strong feeling like, oh, you know, we need to judge brands on this. Although when Beauty Heroes is looking at brands, we are vetting them for their Blue Beauty initiatives and really trying to pull those out of brands so we can tell those stories, so we can make sure we're supporting brands who are considering the environment in their business systems, their packaging, their sourcing, their marketing, and helping to create a better, bluer beauty industry. So why do you think we need a new term for defining beauty that does the right thing by the environment then? Well, it's a term that talks about how I think it's asking more of brands and businesses. And I think as consumers, we're really waking up to the fact that there are businesses that we really want to support um, because they're kind of building a, um, they're, they're building the environment into their bottom line. I think that by creating this term, we're really able to celebrate those initiatives and to classify them as some, as uh, brands that are, that are really making an effort. You know, that's what we really want to do is applaud brands and say, Hey, you know, this is not easy. Creating a beauty brand in general is very challenging. People don't realize how much goes into it from every single ingredient, every single packaging component, every single marketing decision and educating people with so much noise in this industry. How do you really find building in blue initiatives is very, very challenging. And so by classifying it sort of as a blue beauty initiative, we're able to call it out and celebrate it and uh, examine it in a way that helps consumers understand, hey, this brand really cares about the environment and here's what they're doing. And, you know, so it just, it gives it a little bit more of, you know, people under, we've been educating, we've been using our platform to educate people on what Blue Beauty initiatives can look like. There's not a set list of things you have to do to go blue. This is really about embracing a movement and, having a a dialogue and evolving your brand's beauty heroes didn't launch as a blue beauty platform. This is something that we evolved into. We are waking up as as humans and consumers and founders and all wanting to, you know, really push the envelope and create a better, you know, create better products that are better for our, for our world. I feel like it's, feels good for us to be able to tell those stories. And they're varied. Yeah, I totally get it. When I speak to small brand owners, or indie brand owners, you know, often people say, I want to embrace environmental sustainability, but it's hard. It's just like what you touched on, you know, it's hard enough starting a business. So having to embrace all of these additional components can seem very daunting to people. But it's fantastic that so many small brands do want to take on that challenge and really want to step up and and embrace green and blue and, and all kinds of environmentally sustainable beauty. Absolutely. I feel like I've talked to a lot of founders whose head and hearts and inspiration for creating their brand is very much in the right place. Yeah, I totally get it. So let's address this one head on because I think we probably do need to. I think a lot of people might look at blue beauty and think that it's it mainly refers to our oceans and waterways. Does this definition that you're using at Beauty Heroes encompass that too? Is this separate? Do you think there might be some confusion that people might get from hearing the term blue beauty? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I hear that a lot, actually. That's something that comes up a lot. You know, I think it's not enough to just formulate products that are good for our oceans. To me, that doesn't really fall into the definition of blue beauty, eliminating ingredients that are not biodegradable and that impact our oceans. It's not enough to do that, in my opinion, to say, okay, we've done something really great here and we're a really blue company. 
in my definition. So I'll just, you know, call it out like that. You know, beauty heroes, um, our standard includes, uh, our, our ingredient standard for our brands includes that you can't use ingredients that don't, aren't fully biodegradable. So petroleum based ingredients and silicones. It's frustrating. I would say to, there's so many brands that we think are, you know, look great and would be very marketable and we would love to carry them, but they have acrylates or pegs or silicones in them, which silicones aren't necessarily toxic for the body, but they're not good for the environment. And so just eliminating those to me wouldn't classify you as like making a blue beauty initiative. It's kind of like basic, right? It, the whole premise for Beauty Heroes was, hey, once we know an ingredient's not good for us, like don't use it, <laughs> kind of common sense. Um, and once you know an ingredient's not good for the environment, you shouldn't use it. I think that's basic, you know, that's sort of like a basic level. With Blue Beauty, we're trying to have a conversation um, and to celebrate initiatives that are making a net positive effect on the environment. Uh, let's delve into that one a little bit more then. So how can beauty brands have a net positive environmental impact? Because the very definition of a consumer brand means you're producing something to be consumed. So it's not easy to, to put something back into the environment when you're producing an actual product. So how are beauty brands doing that? And can you give us any examples of brands getting it right at the moment? Yeah, I think there's a few good examples. One, you know, there are a lot of brands I would say a handful of brands that are really paying attention to it at the sourcing level. So they're sourcing their ingredients in a way that is regenerative to the environment. True Moringa is a really good example. Um, I don't know if that's a Formula Botanica brand, but uh, it's a, a really great brand that's in Ghana. Um, they source their Moringa from Ghana and through that sourcing, that uh, creating the um, their supply chain of Moringa, they're, uh, you know, employing a community, but they're also regenerating um, and planting trees. So that's a really good example. I would say that's kind of an extreme example. I don't think to start a beauty brand, you need to go and start a Moringa farm in Ghana, but, but it's a good example of a brand. They were just two people who went out and did it. It's not, you know, they didn't have, it's not like their family came from a Moringa farm or anything like that. They really built it from the ground up. Um, Honua is another example that's going into communities in her native Hawaiian islands and working with those communities to create a supply chain for her ingredients and more. So she really wants to uh, regenerate farms uh, through her work and give them an opportunity to create these ingredients for other brands. And that she genuinely really is doing that work on the ground, going to these farms, working with these farmers, um, learning what it takes, buying the ingredients from them and investing the money back into them so they can produce more. So I think those are two good examples of people who are sourcing brands that are, that have done that at the sourcing level. I think that making contributions to environmental causes, you know, we see a lot of brands for every order, they're doing one tree planted. I think that's a great initiative. I think to take that further, seeing some brands really do is engaging their customers in that project, you know, to make it really meaningful. It's really about educating your customer. Okay, you placed an order, we've planted a tree this is kind of what else we're doing. This is how we're tying it all together. I would say, you know, the the brands that I really think of as blue beauty brands, they're not just doing one thing. It's kind of this whole, you know, their, their, their brand really encompasses all the different ways that they can go blue. They're constantly, like I said earlier, evolving. There's one brand that we're doing a, um, a profile on, they're a bigger hair care brand, InnerSense Organic Beauty, and they I've actually been talking with them for a few years about their plastic bottles. They've done a whole slew of things. You know, they became a 1% for the planet company, which means that 1% of top line revenue um, goes back to environmental causes, which sounds like 
a very little bit, but when you're in business, that's actually a lot. They've transferred all of their plastic to post-consumer recycled plastic. Uh, that's a second initiative. And then they are working with an organization called Plastic Bank to become what they're calling plastic proactive, where they are reclaiming and, and collecting more plastic than what they're creating. And they're starting before they can be plastic proactive. They're working with the plastic bank to clean up the last five years of their plastic consumption. So they really thought about it. They didn't say, okay, we're going to start from today and make sure that we're working with the plastic bank to fund collecting more plastic in areas where there's a lot of plastic pollution equal to the amount that we're generating, but we're actually going to look backwards five years. I thought that was a really thoughtful initiative and a good example of how a brand, a bigger brand um, that uses plastic for every single bottle of shampoo and conditioner uh, to frame it. You know, those are the types of stories we're excited to tell. Yeah, well, that's exciting to hear. I mean, I've been talking about this quite a lot on my my own personal Instagram feed recently as well, talking about climate neutral, carbon neutral beauty and what that actually means. And it's the brands who are looking at themselves and who are really saying, okay, where where can we mitigate what we're doing? Where can we change our own processes so that our impacts are lessened? Who I think are doing the best. I think a lot of the big brands are starting to look more at offset schemes so they have the impact and then they just pay to offset it. And that, of course, is never going to have a long term positive change for the environment. But it's exciting to hear about all these small brands who are really delving deep into their own processes and their own ethos and philosophy, really, to figure out how they can do the right thing. Yeah. One of the things I think that's hard for brands is it's very hard to tell your own story. And to say, hey, look what I'm doing, you know, look what we're doing. You need to do that. Um, I think it's really important that brands uh, communicate clearly what they're doing, why they're doing it and have this conversation, you know, not just announce, hey, we're, you know, 1% for the planet company, which is amazing, by the way. Uh, I know because we're a 1% for the planet company and I know how hard that is uh, to actually achieve, but to constantly sort of ingrain that into your brand culture, your customers. Uh, and and through this, what we're doing is we're shifting attitudes. So if a, if a consumer is buying from your brand and they know that, you know, they know that they feel really good and they understand your Blue Beauty initiatives, it starts to change the way that they vet anything in their lives. They will look and see, you know, what is, what is the company that I'm buying my other products from doing for the environment. And it starts to just really raise consciousness. It's not just one thing. It's a sort of commitment throughout the the life of the brand to say, Hey, we want to go in this direction and we want to keep evolving. And as you know, one of the best ways to be blue is to look for ways to embrace innovation early on um, innovation in packaging. We're seeing some, good innovation in zero waste uh, packaging. I would like to see more, but you know, that, that, yep. that's a challenge. Absolutely. It is. So tying into that, how do you think indie beauty brands should be reporting on their sustainability initiatives? Because the big brands generally put out big sustainability reports and, you know, it's all very glossy. Uh, I've worked for major multinationals over the years where this is, you know, a core part of how they operate. But when you're an indie beauty brand, you don't have that, that opportunity necessarily to produce all of that reporting information. So what should indie beauty brands be doing to, to inform people about their sustainability initiatives? Yeah, there's so many different ways. And that's one kind of the point that I was getting at is it's hard for brands to tell their stories. And that's where we try to come in and fill that gap and say, hey, you know, when you have a Blue Beauty initiative, come to Beauty Heroes and we'd love to help you help tell that story for you and give voice to it. I would say the big brands do these sustainability reports because they're reporting to their stakeholders. That's okay and fine. I am more interested in brands who are having a meaningful conversation 
with their customers and changing attitudes. I mean, it's part of your social media plan. It's part of your email communication plan. It's part of every time a founder is going on a podcast, really weaving that in, that story in, and finding opportunities, every opportunity to sort of tell your brand story holistically, always talking about how that's important to your brand. But social media is an amazing tool. We're seeing that right now in America with the the rise and call for racial justice. Social media has been an incredible tool. The reason that we're having this moment in America right now is because of social media. So I think putting together a very brief report and sending it out to your consumers without all the gloss, well-formulated founders, I think can, you know, one of the things we look for at Beauty Heroes is a strong founder and a strong founder voice. Uh, So founders making connection with their customers and really telling them these issues are important to me. It's why I started my brand. You know, it's, it's the work that I want to do in the world and coming from a very authentic place. Those are the brands that I am seeing be most successful. So what advice would you then give to indie beauty brands who want to embrace blue beauty, environmental sustainability, and who want to have a net positive environmental impact? Yeah, I would say on our site, we've got a several, lots of blog posts about this. We're about ready to launch a new website very soon that's got sort of a, a list of what brands can do, what consumers can do, watch for our content and be inspired by it, um, because that is the point of it. It's to inspire others to to, to join in and to, to do more and do what they can. Uh, know that we know that this is, I know that this is very hard, um, and that's why we've created this platform to tell these stories. Um, learn from what other brands are doing. I always tell brands for beauty brands. I, I absolutely believe that there is a uh, DNA in your brand and formulas, and there's lots of things that should pr- be proprietary and that you shouldn't share um, your lab. You maybe your packaging supplier, unless it's, it really depends. I mean, I have some brands who have found a zero waste or really good packaging supplier, and they tell as many brands as they can because they want to share the information. And I think when it comes to best practices in the realm of blue beauty, this is a place where we shouldn't really hold our proprietary, you know, hold things proprietary. We should really share them with others so that, you know, we're contributing to the bigger picture. Sounds great. So then in that case, where can our listeners find out more about Project Blue Beauty and Beauty Heroes? Our website is beauty-heroes.com. Uh, If you go to our blog, you will see we've got at least one Project Blue Beauty blog post every month going back a couple of years, but there's there's a lot of content on there. And as soon as we launch our new site, there will be a brand new uh, Blue Beauty page that has a lot of, you know, it's we've polished up the information. Um, It looks good. In fact, uh, to... Keep it simple. We actually own the URL bluebeauty.com and that will always point to our Blue Beauty page. So it's easier to find. Just look at our content. We're putting out more. Subscribe to our newsletter list. We do uh, so that you can get alerted uh, when new stories come out. So you don't have to check out. So, so you don't have to come back and check back for content. You'll just get it in your inbox. You'll get all of our, um, information if you sign up for a newsletter list, but we do uh, put out Blue Beauty content regularly and you'll find it that way. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking part in Green Beauty Conversations, although perhaps for today we should call it Blue Beauty Conversations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish you the best of luck with Project Blue Beauty. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Appreciate it. Thank you to Jeannie for joining me in our latest podcast episode. Regardless of whether we call it blue beauty, green beauty, teal beauty or verdant beauty, I hope you'll agree that it is refreshing to hear tales of beauty brands around the world who aim to have an environmental benefit. Of course, achieving that lofty goal will be challenging because it will involve looking very closely at a brand's ingredient sourcing strategy, packaging choices, manufacturing processes and the rest of their supply chain. In fact, the only way to have an environmental benefit or a positive environmental impact is either through putting back into the environment, 
perhaps by sequestering carbon through the ingredients farmed for your formulations, or through offsetting, which as we discussed in our recent podcast on whether beauty brands can ever be carbon neutral, is not a panacea, of course, as it is simply a component of your overall environmental strategy, and it ultimately isn't the answer. As a chartered environmentalist, and having myself worked in environmental management since 2003, I can tell you that the beauty industry is one of the most unsustainable industries I've worked in. So it is really heartening to see so many indie beauty brands aim to step it up. Up until really quite recently, no one was even seriously having a conversation about sustainability. So I am pleased to see that things are changing. I hope this podcast has inspired you to think about the environmental sustainability of the beauty industry. If you want to learn more, make sure you check out our previous podcast episodes on carbon neutral beauty and beauty miles. And don't hesitate to send us a message through our social media channels to tell us what you think. I often talk about environmental sustainability in the beauty industry on my own personal Instagram channel too, at Lorraine Dalmayer. So thank you for joining Jeannie and I for this latest episode of Green or Blue Beauty Conversations. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify or Stitcher and stay tuned for the next episode. Follow Formula Botanica at Formula Botanica on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest or LinkedIn. We are everywhere. Visit our website at formulabotanica.com and sign up for our free online course on how to become an organic skincare formulator today. Today.